Once you've recognized that you alone can change your behavior and not the behavior of others, you become a change candidate to an intimate relationship with God. You will begin to correct your own behavior also. You will engage your spouse or your partner in a conscious effort to correct past hurt or pains and you will find ways to create an atmosphere of change in your relationship. Hello once again, welcome to my talk show. My name is Amabala Steven, so I want to talk about how to improve on yourself in your relationship. Now, here are ways you can do these changes or you can achieve these changes. Number one is to set up positive exchanges. Remember that change occurs more often in the presence of positive exchanges. When you praise a child for doing things you like and want to build, you increase in the likelihood that the child will make those changes. Hmm. Adults are not different also. If you praise even small movements in the right direction, you will get change. That's how powerful it is. Praise is powerful. It prepares the atmosphere for change. Hmm. Now, work on yourself. Spend less time blaming and criticizing and more time working on confirming to all that is positive. You need to identify your flaws and correct them when necessary. Or you have the credibility telling your partner or the person in your life what to do. Now, a think like this. If you don't identify your flaws, your shortcomings or your misfits, and you don't make amends or correct them, you do not have any credibility telling your partner or the person what to do. Now that's it. Often, partners say he wants me to change, but he's so messed up himself. Or she paints out my faults, but won't take about us or won't talk about us. That is what's common in relationship. We want to be blaming and accusing people, but we don't need to focus. We don't want to focus on ourselves and see where we need to make changes. Once we're able to make changes in ourselves, it is reflected in others. Others say the right thing about us, and they make change when necessary. It's as simple. Hmm. Now, again, this willingness to see yourself as a work in progress, it creates resentment and resistance to change in your relationship. You don't want it at all. So take responsibility for yourself first, then watch your partner follow suit. I like that. Next is to resolve conflict. A predictor of divorce is in the is inability to resolve conflict. If you're somewhat uncomfortable with conflict, that's okay. It usually relates to your family experience, don't you think? Conflict resolution is a skill that gets better and easier with parties. So, get on with the parties. Don't let this build up at all. It is unhealthy, physically, spiritually, and relationally. Agree with your partner or the person in your life. You know, we're talking about relationship here. So, to have a regular checkups when it comes to disagreements and conflicts, ask... You can ask your partner on how are we doing, anything bothering you that we haven't talked about lately, or do this every day or at least once a week until you raise these issues with regularity. That is how you can get something out of your partner, something that's been keeping up for a long while that has become a pent up feelings. It's time for you to educate them by the way you approach your partner and do things the right way. Conflict, however, is part of every relationship. I want you to know that your ability to resolve it makes the difference and fosters change. Next up is to become empathic. Now, that's very important. Willingness to change is encouraged when a person feels heard and understood. Spouses are famous for stubbornly resisting change when they feel misunderstood. I know that. Your efforts to intellectually defi- identify and vigorously experience your spouse's thoughts, feelings, and attitude is called empathy. Now, that's so sweet. How much empathy do you show? That's a question. Now, give me an answer. <laughs> People really are far less defensive and far more willing to consider options when they are understood. When you put yourself in someone else's shoes and try to understand what they're going to, they are more willing to share from the heart. Don't you think though? Practice listening and then repeat what your partner has said. Now that is great and effective listening. Ask if you got it right and if you accurately reported what the person was feeling or experiencing. This wouldn't be easy, I know, because you are learning a new skill. But it's worth the time, I bet you. Empathy empowers change yes a case next is to last your dependence on the other person now that's it
No one can meet all your needs all the time. Only God can. You need to get that. And since you don't physically live with him yet, I mean God, you're still dependent on others. Now, it is only to have friends to talk with, share activities with, and support. Yes, of course. It's great when you can depend on friends, but balance is the key. Watch that. Balance is the key. When friends replace couple intimacy needs, it is not healthy at all. When others are only your source of support, the same is true. So, balance your intimacy needs between your partner and friends. In the same way that you don't expect one of your friends to meet all your friendship needs, don't go expecting your husband or wife to meet all the other needs. Sexual, spiritual, deep intimate needs are the preserve of good and your spouse alone. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh. Friends can support and add to your intimate covenant relationship, but they should not replace them. They shouldn't at all. Now, take care of yourself. I like this part because it's talking about me. It's talking about you. Self-care is very vital. Again, consider balance when you're doing this. Attending to your own physical, spiritual, and emotional health creates an atmosphere for change. Hmm. Whew. When you value you, others will too. Now, give it a trial and you'll thank me later. <laughs> when you take care of yourself, the burden of worry is lifted from the other person. When you spend yourself beyond reasonable limits, guilt often results. Most women now don't know how to say no or take time for themselves. And I wonder why. Most men also do not nurture themselves spiritually or physically because they are overly busy trying to succeed in life. And I ask again, why? You need to slow down as a man. Now, there's a difference between indulgence and self-care. Now, self-care is simply saying, I need to be responsible for replenishing myself and I will see to it that it happens. Now, that's the way to go. While indulgence is giving in or satisfying a desire or need, that's a difference. When you practice self-care, you are more centered and better equipped to deal with change in your life. Nice one, you see. Oh, I wish that this talk show would not end, but it's got to end. Thank you for sticking around. You can visit my blog site on www.umatter2life.com or on my Facebook page on Mobile Steering. Or perhaps to my Twitter handle at Omobola Baby. You can have a worthwhile learning on the go experience. Thank you for hanging with me once again on today's talk show. I hope to see you around some other time. It's bye for now.